My friend, thanks for joining me. Hi, Tashin. Thank you for having me on your podcast. You're very welcome. I've been excited about this. Um, maybe just to start, it occurs to me it might be useful to have you on record, since this is recording, pronounce your name for us because you know <laughs> people pronounce your name multiple ways. And uh, how, how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> the way I pronounce my name is Elin, which is the Swedish pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And what does your name mean? It means intelligent bringer of light. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I know, um, so we met at Maple when you were training there for a little bit some time ago and became friends there. And uh, I know some people called you alien, which could could have been pejorative, but you seem to take that in stride. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's sort of fitting in some ways to your personality. And uh, <laughs> exactly. And then uh, recently, I know on your Twitter, you had for a while, it's no longer your header, but autocorrect to Elon, <laughs> which I thought was funny. So anyway, it's nice to have you pronounce your name on record. It's, it's a beautiful name. So um, yeah, I think um, maybe just to give a little bit of context, like I really valued our friendship when we were at Maple and it sort of developed since then. And I think we have a lot of shared interests. And uh, I think that there's a lot that I'm interested to learn from you and uh, really happy to have you on just to chat about our mutual interests. So really glad that you could make the time. Um, maybe just to start, I'll ask you the question that I ask everybody, which is what is your life story or background or history? You can answer that in whatever length or detail or way that you like, short, long, you know, poetic, uh, narrative, whatever. Uh, yeah, how, how, wh where are you coming from? Okay, so given that I'm not an alien, mm -hmm. I'm actually a human. I hail from Finland and Russia originally. I grew up in the Netherlands. I learned a couple of languages on the way and I was a professional swimmer, synchronized swimmer while growing up, which I think informed quite a lot of what came afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, synchronizing with people a lot, many mm -hmm. hours each day. I did that and I was quite academically inclined as well. I ended up moving to the United States for university. I studied neurosciences and I took a couple of breaks during my studies because sometimes my mind is quite difficult to deal with and I have a I, I have suffered a lot in life, but this suffering has also led to quite a lot of interesting experiences which have heavily informed my later academic interests and the way in which I built up my narrative. Specifically, I suffered from eating disorders for a very long time and my experiences with them brought me into places that showed me how vast the mind is compared to what I was taught growing up. And, and that informed my desire to study the neurosciences once I returned to university after taking a break. And that's when I started to explore psychoactive substances and meditation. And I ended up, instead of doing an internship at Google or Facebook or whatnot, which is what most of my peers were doing, I ended up going to Maple, which is where I met you, Tashin. And I learned a lot about social communication there, which when I returned back to university after the monastery, set me on some quest to discover what on earth had changed because a lot had changed at the monastery. And when I came back, I didn't know what to do because I was feeling so much all of the time and I had no real frameworks or people to help me figure out what was going on. So I decided to figure out what was going on for myself by 
uh, of course, writing a thesis about compassion because compassion was my obsession mm. for a while. And that is more of a, a side quest in my personal story. My original interest has always been uh, as a teenager to alleviate suffering uh, through the use of technology to alter people's brain activity somehow. Mm. I started thinking about that from fairly early age and that has always driven me in my interests. And now that I'm done with this compassion side quest, it's it's part of me. And now looking forward to developing this, the rest of this identity of alleviating suffering using technologies that alter brain activity. Mm -hmm. What a, a, that's so jam packed. I mean, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure how old you are now, but still, you know, quite young and it's like just very full life already. It's, it's beautiful to hear about. Um, let's see, there's so much I could dive in there. I mean, maybe, maybe to start, could you say more about what the kinds of experiences were that you were having when you were kind of in the thick of your suffering that led you to realize that the mind was sort of vaster and more complex than you had been led to believe? Yes. Uh, so, during my worst period, I was seriously anorexic. Mm. And in, in those states of starvation, I experienced euphoria and lightness that I had never experienced before. Mm. So that was, that was the first sign to me that, wow, there's something else here. But then the real experiences or the most, the more potent experiences came when I was living in an eating disorder clinic in my home country. I was getting treated and I was being refed. I was forced to face my biggest fears head on. Mm. And I was also locked up essentially. I had no freedoms. I had to give up everything in order to get my life back. And that destabilized my entire worldview. And by having my autonomy taken away, I entered this very deep state of having to figure out how, how to survive, how to overcome the horrors that I was experiencing internally. And I started just tripping basically mm. while I was in the clinic. Mm. I, I didn't know what was going on, but I, was, I started recognizing patterns in everything. I thought that whenever I went out on a walk, I kept spotting me, recognizing meaning in the numbers on car signs. Mm. Essentially, certain schizo, schizophrenic symptoms arose. I started to understand Chinese mm. and languages that I'd never learned. At least I had the the feeling that I could understand everything. Hmm. I don't, I had never confirmed whether or not that was true. I started hallucinating occasionally and getting insight into whatever I focused on deeply. So I could hyper focus on a cucumber and fully understand it in a way that doesn't, ha hasn't happened for me during normal cognition. And there are vast alterations in time. I occasionally fell into what maybe conventionally people refer to as, as the null point or just pure emptiness. I've, I, I would fall into those states which were both horrifying and, and blissful. And as a, as a 19 year old, that was puzzling because no one was talking about that. Mm -hmm. And I was experiencing that on my own in this clinic and people, I, I couldn't talk, talk about my experiences to people because I didn't want to get medicated. Mm. I was not on any medications at the time and I was, was very much against them. So I didn't say anything about what was happening, but I went to Google to find out what was going on. And Google suggested that I may have been tripping on LSD or psilocybin 
which I was not. Mm. I didn't even know what those were. Uh -huh. I didn't know what drugs, that drugs existed. I just had a vague idea, yes, there is something that I'm not supposed to think about or talk about. But because I was having these odd experiences or entering other states of consciousness spontaneously during this recovery process, as a function of this extreme perturbation to my my way of being and my worldviews, my brain just started to pattern match to different things, trying to figure out how, how can I make sense of the world around me? Um, yeah, so, so I became interested in psychoactive substances because I discovered they could do what my brain was doing on its own. And I went into a rabbit hole exploring various forms online and kind of grasped on to grasp grasped onto the notion of psychoactive substances as something that I could dedicate myself towards studying for probably the rest of my life because it was so interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow, I, I'm just that that's like a set of experiences that I've like never had independently and then putting them all together like all in one just you know at 19 in, in you know in the treatment facility and like going through this eating disorder and just having all these experiences arise like that sounds very intense and overwhelming and um i'm i'm like grateful and impressed that you sort of uh made it out of there like found your way out and had the ability to like sense make and try new things and um it makes me curious like you know, you found psychedelics through that, you know, research that you did. And, um, you know, you also mentioned that's when you started meditating. Like, what what was it like when you started exploring these things for yourself? And how did, how did that adjust the experiences that you had? So after leaving the clinic, I stopped having such intense experiences, also somewhat consciously. It, it's difficult to have those, those kinds of experiences. I could, I could have them in a container where everyone was taking care of me all the time and were treating me like a, like a sick person, so I had the permission to go into extreme states but once i was out i i had to find a way to normalize my way of being so i stopped having such intense experiences as as often as i was having in the clinic i spent a while just living normally on my own in finland but I explored things like holotropic breathwork and very and, and Wim Hof. Uh, I didn't really meditate, but I did breathing exercises, mm. which were very psychedelic in their own way. And I was very good at them because I could hold my breath for, for a very long time, maybe seven minutes at mm. a time back then. So I, I, I could further explore altered states through my breath. And they also, I also use them as a technique to change my personality over time. Mm, I didn't really formally meditate until I came to Maple, but that was two years later. I started official, officially or formally exploring substances uh, very carefully at very small dosages with a person that I trusted deeply whom I'd met at a conference on psychedelics and they were very well informed and quite experienced and I felt good trying new substances around them. And it was good enough for me to take very small dosages and to end up in thing, in places like the 11th dimension as I, as, I, as I would call it. And very slowly I built up a repertoire of a couple of experiences with various psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, MDMA. 
I think my experience with MDMA was quite informative. The very first time I took it, um, it was quite different from what most people describe MDMA to be like. For me, it was very scary and painful. I started freezing. I became socially withdrawn and fell into a bit of suicidal ideation, which is just not the same as wanting to dance and feeling warm and your heart racing and loving everybody. So that was confusing to me. Why did that happen? I didn't know, but I kept that in the back of my mind and answers became clear as I kept exploring the topic of compassion and self-compassion and love. Yeah, I definitely want to get to that portion for sure. I, I am maybe just to start when you say that you use the breath work to change your personality. What what does that mean? What what kinds of changes did you make and how did that happen? So I went to a holotropic breathwork session in Finland one time. And are, are you familiar with this practice? A little bit, but maybe you could say more just in case someone isn't. Okay. So holotropic breathing is a modality that Stan Groff and his wife developed as an alternative to LSD therapy. So once LSD became banned back in the 70s, uh, Stan Groff, he, he, was a, he was a prominent psychotherapist who worked with psychoactive substances uh, from, Czech, from Czech. And he, he was practicing in the United States, but he then had to come up with another way to work with his clients uh, because he liked working with expanded states of consciousness. And he came up with holotropic breathing, which is, is, a, is, a, is a way of breathing for three hours. Mm. And it allows you to enter fairly deep altered states of consciousness. Mm. And he would use that uh, to explore people's subconscious and unconscious as well as content would come come up into people's awareness and then that would be a way to allow people to integrate parts of themselves that they had no access to prior and it, it's also an excellent way to move energy through the body and to active activate the nervous system maybe move various blockages out and then mm. shake them out mm. with breath so you were using holotropic breathing and, and what, what kinds of changes did you experience having to your personality through that practice? So I, I had some, I, I had a very scary holotropic breathwork session and a very beautiful holotropic breathwork session. I, I did two. And in the first one, I explored various hell realms mm. and I was releasing demons from the nervous system. But then in the second session, I got to experience my inner beauty. I, I became friends with various goddesses and they showed me how, how wonderful I was and how, how I could appreciate myself. Mm. And they taught me these different ways of being a goddess. And that was the first time that I'd, that I'd encountered some positive association with femininity. And that was something that was greatly lacking in, in the past for me. And so I started to embrace femininity for the first time after that holotropic breathwork session. And well, specific personality changes were, I became very interested in, in clothing and trying to look beautiful in a way that made it feel fun and so I, I just dressed up a lot and walked around feeling like a goddess. Mm. That that was that was a period of my life. Mm. It's beautiful. There's a there's a um, question that's arising for me. I'm not sure how to articulate it, but it's something like you know, um, 
you've mentioned a few different things that are sort of outside of normal experience or at least my normal experience and, and you know because we're friends I I trust you I'm like oh yeah she definitely talked to some goddesses and they told her that she was beautiful and that she could love herself and uh, uh she did visit the 11th dimension and hell realms and you know <laughs> had experiences of voidness and um uh I'm you know someone listening to this may not trust you in that way I don't know or may not know you or have that basis for trust uh but in any case it's sort of either way it's it's um outside of at least my everyday waking experience and um i wonder what's the question it's something like yeah what what are those experiences and how do they relate to our sort of normal waking consciousness how do That's you understand a good them question yeah, it's a good question because this material space looks very different from what what can be experienced mm. without processing information directly from the material world. I can say that the brain is a very complex organ, and we we vastly underestimate what it is capable of. It's hard to necessarily give a good answer on what is going on for me because my perception and understanding of the brain is constantly changing. But briefly, maybe the brain is an information processing system. It consists of billions of cells that are all hyper-connected in very complicated ways. And I don't know how far away we are from fully mapping out a human brain. We've barely mapped out mice brains, maybe just one cubic centimeter in its entirety. So we have a long way to go. Uh, so given that, the brain is complex. It processes information. And when we open our eyes and go about our daily lives, we're just receiving information with our five, with our five senses uh, and, and integrating that information into some worldview that is attainable to our needs and requirements for basic survival throughout that day. But if we close our eyes and maybe separate ourselves from the need to process direct information from our environments, there are many new ways of combining information uh, in our brains uh, because we aren't processing light. We can generate our own visual, internal visual experiences. And there are also ways of increasing the energy parameter uh, of, of our brain states through these practices, which is why we can enter much more intense states, uh, intense visionary states. Normally we operate at, at, a, at a level that is just enough to get by. And the, the brain doesn't use that much energy then, but we can increase this energy parameter and process more information in more complex fluid ways. And that correlates to these altered states. Hmm. Yeah, there, there's just a lot that the brain can do. Hmm. And people underestimate that hmm. because maybe they just never tried to explore the inside the, the inside of their brain, maybe because they've never tried a substance, maybe because they've never even considered how perplexingly cool the brain is, mm. and they just don't understand what it is capable of doing. Mm. Mm. That makes sense. That's pretty helpful. Thank you. Um, maybe to fast forward a little bit, you mentioned that 
when you came back from Maple, things were also very different for you. And um, I wonder if you could talk more about that, like what kind of changes happened while you were doing the mastic training and um, how you experienced that, like what the shifts were. So at Maple, we did a lot of interpersonal meditation, which is specific to Maple. And I don't think that happens in too many other monasteries yet. Interpersonal meditation was very a very intense way for me to connect with others. It was very direct. We you, you have to be somatically and emotionally present at every single moment. And the point is to just experience yourself. There are no alternative intellectually driven goals like you have in academic environments where you're you're simply following uh, some task list or desires for for discovery of some idea and so you ignore a bunch of emotional information you just focus on intellectual content circling you focus on the body and everything that's happening there and learning to do that and actually experiencing that made me get used to ex doing that all of the time, whereas before I wasn't doing that. So when I came back to university, I was very sensitive to people's emotional states and they, they were always very salient to me. I was very interested in, in what was going on for the other person. So I was always oriented in an empathic way towards everybody. So I was extremely receptive to everyone's emotional states. And I was also much more aware of suffering and pain. And I'd adopted a frame that we should be decreasing the suffering in the world as also for the first time introduced to the ideas of effective altruism at the monastery. And that became incorporated. And so I was very confused when I came back to campus because I was feeling everything and I was seeing how sad students were and how stressed everyone, almost everyone was and depressed. And I felt overwhelmed by, by these negative emotions because I didn't want people to feel the way they were feeling. So I guess I, I was just experiencing a lot of empathic distress, which isn't very productive, it's just draining. And I didn't know what to do with that. I remember visiting the Dean of Religious Life, Religious and Spiritual Life at my university and talking about the, the, the experience of feeling everyone's pain all of the time he told me to stop doing that mm. it's their pain and I stopped doing it as much I, I think I spent the next year and year and a half trying to orient myself in this new social environment where nobody was circling and nobody cared about the somatic and deeply emotional form of communication, I, I had to learn how to set boundaries. I, I had to learn how to stop feeling drained. So I moved from, an, from being empathic to being compassionate, which is a different way of orienting myself towards people around me. And it's a way that doesn't drain me and is in fact uh, empowering and energizing for both parties. And I also explored self-other distinction quite a lot. I experimented by blurring the boundaries between myself and others for the purpose of writing my thesis and understanding how, how does the brain distinguish the difference between me and this other body? Is there a difference? Can I remove the perception of there being a difference? And if so, 
what how, how does that happen how does the brain mediate this process so yes yeah, so over over the next year and a half i experimented in various social settings and also with various substances and yeah investigated as much as i could within this social and compassionate domains of being so that I could later write something about it. In retrospect, do you think that the Dean's advice was good advice for you? I think it, it triggered a process of deeper inquiry because I was quite naively witnessing everyone's pain and not doing anything about it. It wasn't helpful for anyone. It was just painful. So his, his advice or his words, they made me want to explore how else could I relate to other people's pain. And what was the transition between empathy and compassion? Uh, what, what happened there and how did you do that? So firstly, I had to learn what compassion was and I, I had to come into greater, deeper contact with the experience of, of love, warmth, for social connection and, and the heart space. I did, I started doing lots of meta practice of first, which is different from compassion, but they are, they're connected. I experienced what colloquially, colloquially one could call a heart chakra awakening mm. during, during my period of practice after I came back from the monastery, where suddenly my heart space became a permanent element within my awareness. The warmth in my chest was always part of my experience. And so it feels like I can love everybody all of the time, regardless of what's happening, regardless of how much I also hate them and am mm. angry at them, I still also love them. Mm. But the transition into compassion came actually as I was also writing my thesis and reading about compassion uh, and how people within neuroscience were defining it. And I actually really needed to learn what compassion was in order to in order to save myself essentially and save others from the suffering that I was going through. Compassion, so compassion is defined as uh, the motivation and or, or the awareness of other, of suffering and the motivation to alleviate it. Not the action, but the, the motivation to alleviate that suffering. And empathy is just, uh, just resonating with, with the emotional state of another person. It, it's the same as you feel this and I feel this as well. But compassion is you feel this and I feel and understand that you're feeling that. And I hope that there's something that can help that go away. And I want you to stop feeling so bad. That is, that is a very simplified way of putting it. I had to move into compassion so that I could feel free, so that I didn't have to take on the burden all of the time. I moved into compassion so that I could remain in a positive emotional state, so that I could actually help others and not be dragged down by their suffering and not allow them to become dragged down by my suffering. So it was a very strong 
cognitive and framing shift. Do you remember what you actually did to make that shift? It was many things mm -hmm. and it was progressive. Mm -hmm. What I actually did mm -hmm. looked like doing a bunch of eye gazing mm. with various individuals, doing lots of mirror gazing and looking at myself and exploring all the emotions that would arise in that. It was taking various pathogens and doing interpersonal meditation while in these altered states. It looked like being a pure mental health advisor at an eating club at Princeton and helping people move through difficult experiences there. It looked like walking on the street and purposefully practicing being as compassionate as possible towards everybody and fully giving myself to the service of the other, but in a way that, that felt good. Hmm. And that over the period of several months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm wanting to know more about the qualitative difference between empathy and compassion. Um, like it's from the way that you're describing it, it sounds like the main thing that's different is the desire to alleviate the suffering that you're not just feeling the same thing, but that you're wanting to wanting it to diminish or um, well, is, is that is that a fair uh, articulation of the difference as you understand it? Yes, that mm -hmm. is the definitional difference. Mm -hmm. So empathy is, is just the undifferentiated or, or it, it's, it's resonating with another person's state regardless of what what valence their state is, whether it is positive or negative, you resonate with their state. Mm -hmm. They're vibrating at one frequency and you begin to resonate with that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You're mm -hmm. just experiencing or generating a similar internal state to what you are perceiving. And that's where it ends. Mm -hmm. So if, if the person you, you're interacting with is is experiencing a lot of pain then within the frame of empathy you're just going to be internally generating a similar state of pain to what it is that you're perceiving and that's where it ends you you're just experiencing that pain and mm -hmm. nothing happens and with compassion you so so there there are many definitions of compassion within neuroscience. There are many models to describe how to reach compassion or what compassion is. But I, I focused on one model because I thought it was quite neat. But as an aside, there are many ways of framing and defining what compassion is. But within this model that I explored uh, just briefly, uh, it it's a procedural model that describes how one can go from uh, emotional contagion, which is the automatic resonant, the automatic uh, way in which we begin to resonate with other people's states. Uh, our, our brains, they have mirror neurons, which, which activate or fire when we perceive somebody doing something. So essentially they're always activated and their goal is to help us understand the, the, what, what another person is doing, what their goals might be, what their internal state might be. Uh, once these fire, uh, there's some <laughs> information gets sent to various networks that help us identify both what they're 
affective state is, what their cognitive state might be, what their somatory state is, and whether or not it is us who's feeling this or, or whether it is them who's feeling this. So information gets sent to these various networks that uh, identify what is going on, what is the emotion, what is the cognition, and is it me or is it someone else who's experiencing this, uh, this information that is being generated uh, by these mirror neurons. So, so that, that's emotional contagion. We automatically begin to resonate or generate the other person's state. Then, and this is, this is subconscious. And then we move into a state of empathy where we differentiate uh, ourselves, our, our experience from the other person's experience. Uh, and then we move into sympathy, where, where we ask the question, how would I feel if I was in the position of the other person? So there is more of an egocentric uh, understanding of the other person's experience. In empathy, there is an allocentric understanding of the other person's experience. We understand that what we are feeling uh, right now is referential to the other person's state. This is what the other person is experiencing and I am generating a model of that. In sympathy, there is an additional layer of abstraction where we are applying that model to ourselves. How would it feel if I was in the same situation? Then this shift towards compassion happens once again when we uh, add another layer of abstraction and say, this is what the other person is experiencing. And we add this component, this motivational component to alleviate hmm. whatever suffering is being perceived. And there's a focus on suffering and pain within compassion, which is not the case for metta and loving kindness, which is also a different state that I didn't explore in depth in, in any models. And um, it sounds like from the way that you're describing it, if you proceed through those stages of empathy to uh, differentiation, to sympathy, to compassion, that that's qualitatively different and better than just empathy. Uh, um, why why would that be the case? Um, and in particular, like why would why would that motivational component of wanting to relieve the suffering uh, make it qualitatively better? Hmm. That's a good question. Why is it better to want to alleviate the suffering that exists in the world hmm. rather than not doing anything mm. or not wanting to do anything, not having the desire to do anything. Mm. So firstly, uh, taking, taking a few steps back in, in just empathy, what, one, of, one of the motivations that I presented in my thesis as to why it's so important that we think more deeply about compassion within the field of neuroscience is that it could help uh, people who are working within nursing or teaching or various jobs that involve a lot of social, social emotional labor to experience less empathic distress and fatigue because a lot of individuals working in these fields uh, express that they they get drained by witnessing so much suffering and having to deal with that. And training in compassion could help people develop a resilience and an ability to deal effectively with in environments where they're exposed to other people's distress. Uh, 
Um, now, getting back to the question, why is it good to have the desire to alleviate suffering? Why would that cause a qualitative difference such that it's better? Qualitative difference. Yeah. Is I mean maybe maybe to add a little bit to the question, um, you know, um, one way that. I might have been tempted to differentiate compassion from empathy is, oh, it is empathy. You are feeling what the other person is feeling, but you are um, uh, also, it seems like an important, it may, maybe that this wouldn't fully it be it, but that another important component could be equanimity, that you're not um, resisting it or pushing it away or grasping onto it in any way. You're you know, allowing it to be the experience that you're resonating with without it overtaking you. Um, and it sounds like from the way that you're describing it, um, the motivation to reduce the suffering, not yet the action to reduce suffering, just the desire is a critical ingredient to uh, making it um, more sustainable for the heart to feel other people's pain or suffering. I think what you just said, equanimity, I, I, should, have, I should have also mentioned it, but mm. equanimity is, is a is a vital component of uh, effective compassion because within compassion you are you're becoming aware and immediately facing the distress of others and having equanimity uh, really helps in being able to handle that. Uh, but the motivational disposition, I think it's important. to realize that I, I think it's it's a larger question of what is what is the what is the goal here? What could the goal be as as a conscious being in in a world where there are other beings that experience pain or suffering? Do we want this to continue? Do do you want more beings to feel less suffering or to feel less pain? There, there's a difference between pain and suffering as well. The, the, part, the, the importance of this motivation is connected to this conviction that it is possible to alleviate that suffering and that alleviating the suffering is somehow better than than not alleviating it. But these are also bigger spiritual questions that I don't know if I'm fully able to respond to. Hmm. Sh should, should pain be eliminated? I, I personally believe yes. Uh -huh. I, think, I think we should abolish hmm. suffering. Hmm. But that, that is, I'm also informed by other people's work when it comes to this opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly from where I'm coming from, um, you know, definitely from a Buddhist background and a Mahayana Buddhist background and want to alleviate suffering, at least I, I haven't considered whether it would be worth it to alleviate pain entirely. I know, I know subjectively, I would love to not ever have pain again. I think that was uh, a motivating reason for me to start practicing back in the day and is probably still subconsciously there um but that, that that feels like a whole other ball game the, 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 sort of the angle that i'm getting at is um you yourself were suddenly very empathic and you had to learn how to be compassionate as, instead and that made your life qualitatively better and i'm wondering how you look at that like what what was the subjective difference for you such that when you became compassionate instead of empathic, you know, and, and it took months and lots of different experiments and so on. Um, what sense do you make of what that was like in your experience? Why adding that motivation to reduce the suffering would be qualitatively different and better than just resonating with people, just having that empathy. How, how do you make sense of that in your own experience?
Hmm. I don't know if I can give a clean answer, mm -hmm. but I can describe describe what I was experiencing back during my empathy phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling very drained all of the time and I felt a lot of anger towards others. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was being used because I was walking around and interacting with people and noticing their pain and trying so hard to process it for them and then to have them feel better afterwards and they, they maybe would, they maybe wouldn't, but they just walk away and I'd feel like I, I'd got a nothing back. Mm. That was, that was my subjective mm. experience. So mm. what was going on? Mm. So just started feeling vengeful. Mm. And what was your experience? How did that shift when you sort of transitioned into being more of this place of compassion rather than empathy? In compassion, I was, I, I realized how important it was to myself remain in a positive, effective state. Mm -hmm. As I learned about the neurobiology of positive emotions and negative emotions and how bodies attune to one another and how bodies affect each other simply by being present in the same room, not even looking at each other, maybe even merely through the influence of the magnetic field produced by the heart. I realized that if I'm in a negative emotional state, then that will only cause entrainment to this negative emotional state. Mm. If I'm in a positive emotional state, so not allowing myself to be directly affected by the negative states of other people, I could influence their nervous systems with my positive affect while being aware cognitively understanding and processing the information that I'm uh, perceiving and receiving, understanding that they're in a negative affective state, their HRV, heart rate variability might be lowered for some reason, they might have an increased heart rate, irregular heart rate, increased breathing. I don't have to start mimicking that. I don't have to synchronize with their neurophysiology. I can remain in my heightened state of heart rate var variability. I can remain calm and I can feel and experience love and project that emotion to them and act as, as an agent that they can attune to to alleviate their negative emotional state. Hmm. Uh, there's so many, so many questions I have here for you. Um, maybe I think it'd be useful to take a step back and could you describe in broad strokes kind of what the thesis that you wrote was and how you set about doing the research that you did? So I wrote a thesis in my senior year called Cultivating interpersonal compassionate states, uh, interpersonal compassionate coherence, mm. which was quite an odd thesis, I think. Not many other people, no, nobody else was going down that road. And I couldn't do any experiments because of COVID. I had to write this during the peak of the pandemic, essentially alone in mm. my room. <laughs> which wow. is not fun at all. It was very challenging. I, I wrote it in two weeks, which isn't great, but the circumstances were, the circumstances were as they were. 
I did a lot of literature review beforehand. I read many articles and a couple of books, uh, review, reviewed lots of research that had been done on compassion, on interceptive processing, on mindfulness, on the heart, on the vagus nerve, which is, I think, a buzzword these days, polyvagal theory, all a bit buzzy. Mm. Everyone's talking about it in somatic communities. I explored things behind my laptop mm. and then went out and experimented on my own in whatever social circumstances I could find myself in during the pandemic, which was meek, but I lived in a house with people. Mm. So I, I did have access to people. Mm. Mm. What was the, what, what, what else did you ask? Uh, just kind of asking about your thesis. Um, maybe, maybe you could add what kinds of conclusions you came to or, or what you articulated in the paper. Right. I, I guess initially I wanted to perform an experiment. Mm. I had come up with some, I, I had come up with an experimental design where I would test how much an advanced meditator, an advanced loving kindness meditator could influence the, the state of uh, an amateur or, mm. or a novice mm. in interpersonal meditation. Mm. So I, I thought it would be fun to have an advanced meditator and a novice sit facing each other in lotus pose or just sitting on a chair, eye gaze, and have the advanced meditator a beam or intentionally beam loving kindness towards the novice and see what would happen. I'd mm -hmm. measure how would their heart measures change, how would their breathing measures change, skin measures. And I was also hoping to do some uh, FNIRs or hyperscanning EEG as being ambitious, mm -hmm. but none of that could happen because I couldn't work with people mm -hmm. during the pandemic. So that was how I initially wanted to explore the effects of loving kindness and also compassion. But then I, yeah, I had to just do a literature review. And the reason I really wanted to write this thesis was so that a once and for all, I could answer for myself what on, what on earth was happening mm. because I was having so many intense intensely loving experiences and i didn't know how it was possible to love so much mm. and to 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 stare at people for so long and it just kept getting better mm. and i wanted to know why and i also didn't want to i i didn't want to only have the ability to explain these experiences using wishy-washy language. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have, to develop a more scientific understanding. So that's why I wrote the thesis, but I also wanted to write something that could help others understand compassion rather than only understanding it through spiritual lenses. I wrote this thesis so that a lay person could also explore the more scientific angles of it and I initially wrote it in rather colloquial language and my advisor said no mm -hmm. add more neuroscience mm. if you're writing it in colloquial language just publish a book for the lay person so I had to go into greater depth which was very good very positive mm. I got to learn more so yes my intention was to write something for everyone to understand and to maybe explore compassion more for themselves. And I think my thesis is still quite readable to most people. And it just presents some studies for, yeah, it just presents some extra studies that might not be too interesting to read about, but they're there. Hmm. And what did you say in the paper? So I, I wrote several chapters 
I explore, I took compassion and I broke it down into various components that put together could help one to understand how compassionate states of consciousness arise and specifically how they can arise and be strengthened and developed in interpersonal uh, modal practice modalities. I also did an ethnographic study, which, which you were a participant of, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful that, that I could talk to you about it. Um, I discussed basically the difference between empathy, sympathy, altruism, compassion, loving kindness. I discussed the mirror nervous system. I discussed how the brain differentiates between self and other. I discussed how, how eye gaze works, and how eye gaze can work to synchronize both behaviors and uh, brain and processing within brains. For example, eye gaze can, prolonged eye gaze between, in a diet can cause um, linguistic regions of the brain to synchronize between two different brains, which I think is so interesting mm. because I've had moments where I thought, wow, is this telepathy? And maybe we'll, we'll probably know, but it feels like telepathy because maybe our language centers are beginning to sync up. And so it feels that there seems to be some greater coherence in in language processing. So that might feel like telepathy, or something along those lines. I also wrote about polyvagal theory in, in just a sweeping stroke because it's necessary to understand uh, the vagal nerve and its function in relation to the heart and the respiratory system because the heart is very much involved in the experience of love and compassion. And I wanted to write about the heart because it was such a prominent experience opening up this heart chakra. Turns out the heart actually has oxytocin receptors and it is able to produce oxytocin. And the reason I mention oxytocin is because I also wrote about it. It's an important neuropeptide and hormone that is involved in various prosocial functions and also uh, child rearing but that that's that's a separate question i also explored uh, changes that happen in the brain uh, when people are either trained in compassion or trained in the skill of empathy, there are differences in how the brain changes uh, corresponding to those trainings. I explored facial mimicry and the importance of paying attention to the face and how uh, what kinds of factors can can influence the yeah, processing of uh, information from the face, facial expressions. I also wanted to explore empathogens, but I couldn't find any interesting neural imaging data on that. So mm. I just left it out because there's, at the time of writing, there are only psychiatric results, which weren't interesting for a neuroscience thesis. Mm. Mm. Maybe one final thing mm. to add. At the end of my thesis, I, I wrote a bunch of little vignettes from my personal life, which corresponded to each of the chapters of my thesis to give a sort of window and personal touch uh, to understand how, how personal experience related to my desire to explore a particular component of this broader topic of compassion and I think I sent you those those little vignettes but I didn't send you my full thesis uh -huh. yes yeah they were delightful to read and I also um 
you know, you mentioned that I was part of the ethnographic study and uh, just doing that interview was very uh, illuminating for me. I like enjoyed it quite a bit and I found myself saying things about loving kindness that I didn't know that I believed. And it was, it was like nice to say them because some of the, I mean, some of my beliefs about loving kindness get pretty out there and it's like, oh, it was nice to like air them as it were and uh, share them with someone that wouldn't perhaps think I was crazy or something. But, you know, like for example, that, you know, uh, when you do loving kindness, it affects other people, you know, like, whoa, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I think um, that's a really helpful overview. And I'd like to ask you, you know, imagine that someone listening to this is kind of in a similar position that you were when you came back from the monastery and you were at school and you were just in this sort of like empathic overload and you were just resonating with everyone all the time. And you're sort of overwhelmed by that and resentful of that. And just like, uh, what do I do? Um, you know, you, you, you tried a lot of things and read a lot of different things and did research and experimented a lot. And, um, you know, what would you advise someone that's in a similar position that you were in or, or your past self, you know, uh, how, how does one deal with this, uh, empathy overload and how does one make that transition into compassion? What, what do you do practically? What advice would you give someone that's in that situation? Mm -hmm. I can give practical advice mm -hmm. and I can give advice for framing mm -hmm. how to how to orient towards other people mm -hmm. on a practical level finding ways to open the heart or finding ways to feel more of your heart area of, of your chest is very helpful because feeling warm there and feeling open is so helpful and makes it much easier to process any emotion that comes up because you can always filter it somehow through this warmth. So doing various poses that stretch and open up this area and breathing in ways that heat up the chest so doing breath of fire and just really focusing on making the chest vibrate chanting helps a lot people think of many people don't like to chant but it's actually a very basic mechanical thing and it works mm because you're just making different parts of your body resonate. Mm. And there's some mantras that, uh, that specifically engage the chest and the heart more. So focusing on chanting those mantras and really feeling into it and really, really thinking about the mechanics of it, not the spiritual aspect of it, but just the mechanics is very helpful. Mm. One, one big transformation that happened to me was my, my rib cage, the, the structure of it changed or how my rib cage rests on my spine has changed. Mm. That has made it easier for me to uh, process, uh, information, process signals from my heart. It's, I think these, these structural changes in how the spine is oriented make quite a difference because it it's it just makes it easier for for nerve signals to pass through unhindered uninhibited more quickly more easily um also just focusing on feeling things in the chest increases potentially there aren't any good studies yet that either confirm or deny this, but my my thoughts are that focusing on heart base on the heart can increase innervation to the chest area, which correlates to what people associate often with the experience of love. And love is such a nice state to be in. And it's enough to keep you resilient, just mm. cultivating positive emotional states is so helpful in dealing with any negativity that is encountered outside of oneself. 
as long as you know how to cultivate pleasant states in your own body, recognizing what feels good, then that makes you more resilient in social situations. And then some framing, you are allowed to set boundaries. You are allowed to not melt into everyone around you. Mm. For a while, I had no idea who I was. I didn't know where Ellen ended and started and mm. or Aileen ended or started or where anybody else ended or started. When I was hearing somebody speak, it felt like I was the one speaking in my subjective experience. The voice was just a signal in my, in, in my experience. So how could it not be me? It's my brain generating the experience of hearing the other person speaking. So that other person is me because I'm hearing them. But no, you can set boundaries and you should set boundaries because we're humans and it's, it can be quite helpful when things get overwhelming if you're just, if your sense of self is expanded too much and it's overwhelming. But it can also be very easy to remain this expanded sense and experience of self where there is no clear distinction between self and other. So it depends on the person, I guess. It depends on what you need. There was a time when it was easier for me to not have a clear sense of self. Then there are other times where it has been very helpful to have this clear separation and distinction. So explore that. One way of exploring this, this shift between distinguishing between self and other is labeling whatever you're hearing with I, or I am saying this. When someone else is speaking, just label it with this is me. This mm. is me. And eventually that begins to feel more and more as, as though it's yourself producing wow. that wow. experience. So that's an experiment to try. Another frame is, I don't have to feel bad. I don't have to feel negative. There, it's not better to feel bad. It, it does, it, I don't have to feel bad when someone else is feeling bad. In fact, it's maybe not helpful at all for anybody. That was very important for me to realize that there's nothing wrong with feeling good, with being in a positive plebeian state when someone else is not, mm. allowing that to be true and realizing, for me, the realization of the moral okayness, being in a positive state when someone else is not, I, I, I got through that, I got to that conclusion through understanding how bodies affect each other, which I mentioned earlier. Mm. Mm. This is really interesting stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of plotting how I'm going to be experimenting with this. And I think um, one thing I'm kind of chewing on amongst others is uh, You know, I mean, part, part of the place that I'm coming from is as I, I teach love and kindness and the Brahma Viharas and sort of I'm trying to spread those in the world and I'm actively interested in ways that one might um, engender or increase loving kindness, the feelings of love for people um, in, in all of their varieties. I, I've, I've personally found it helpful to not make such a, a strict distinction between the Brahma Viharas or between different flavors and think of it more as like a spectrum of love of like, you know, there's just a whole swath of positive feelings and in these practices, like any of them are fair game and they can sort of bleed into each other. And, um, you know, if you're feeling one day, one way, one day, that's fine and a different way, a different day, but um, uh, that there's not such a stark difference between them. It's just sort of a, a spectrum. And um, in any case, um, I'm, you know, from a practical perspective, when I when I sort of share loving kindness with the world, it seems to me sort of pedagogically that one of the main things to do is to help people to um, learn to feel these feelings in their heart and feel it in their chest. And that like 
making the jump between it being a primarily mental activity to an embodied activity is, is really my main goal, like help as many people as possible be able to feel these feelings in their heart when they want to. And then, you know, at that at that point, as far as I'm concerned, I'd, I'd be curious to see how other meta teachers would talk about this. But for me, the way I think about it, like at that point, the, the name of the game becomes very simple. It's just like feel this love as much as possible, as often as possible for as many people as possible, you know, with as large a spatial volume as possible. Um, just keep going in the direction of more, more frequently. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm wondering in the back of my head if if it might be possible to use some of these experiments and maybe perhaps eye contact. Yeah, like I, I kind of want to run the experiments you're talking about to help people feel loving kindness, you know, even if I'm not measuring it with different scientific apparatus, just like, oh, can I sort of, uh, can I or other people sort of transmit loving kindness or, or um, similarly, it really seems to me that metta is very social. And like, I know when I practice metta with other people, it's like, oh, they, there's sort of a, 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 um, a capacity that I've cultivated myself to feel loving kindness to a certain degree in a certain way. But then when I practice with other people, it's like, you know, it just goes off the charts and it's, it's like augmented. And if there's multiple people practicing together, it's like uh, much, much higher uh, possibility to feel those feelings. And uh, the range of what kinds of feelings are available. And so I'm like, well, yeah, you could use it to like, see if you could transmit the feelings to someone, but you could also like get some ex multiple experienced loving kindness practitioners together and have them do eye contact with each other and radiate each other. Like, never mind teaching it to someone, let's just feel more of it. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of running in the background. I am curious if you have any thoughts about this little meta rant I've just gotten on. <laughs> So having a meta farm could be good. Yes. We can harvest a meta uh, yes. from people, <laughs> have them you know, all it's... sit in a circle. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how we would harvest it though. We, it, we it's could funny generate that you... so much meta. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it's funny that you speak of it that way because someone, I was on a retreat recently and I was primarily practicing meta and then the concentration states and and then also tai chi but there was this there was some chanting that we did that was new to me and uh one of the chants the person mentioned that they had heard that uh devas which are sort of uh for those that don't know like uh non-material positive entities sort of like angels i guess you might say something like angels in the buddhist context that devas feed on metta that they like eat Meta and they like come to the meta. If people are practicing meta, they like come and they like feed <laughs> off of the meta. Uh, and that seemed very, very wholesome, you know, in, in the Buddhist context. Like, yes, please, like Davis, please come and bless us with your presence. Uh, you know, I'm 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 very here for that in my worldview. Um, like, yeah, Davis good, feed the Davis meta good. Uh yeah. Uh, it does seem, it does seem very much like a like a collective generation thing and also uh uh yeah almost the self other distinction really blurs in those settings to like who's generating the meta and 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 who's feeling the meta and and how does it just it just bounces off each other and it's like yeah there's just a lot of meta here and we're yeah hmm. The difference between or learning to feel meta in the body as opposed to purely experiencing it as a as a concept, that is a big step. And I think for me, I, I was lucky. I don't know how how other people could get this experience, but the first time I felt extremely loved and accepted for, well, not the first time, I've had a couple of very significant lucky moments. But one of them was with Soryu mm. during the three day period that he came to visit Maple that summer, the summer that I was an apprentice there. 
during one of our interviews, I came into the room and I was meditating during my meditation sessions. I was going through hell realms again. Mm. I was meeting demons, my mind and everything was awful. And I came into the interview room and just sat down with the heaviness that uh, heaviness and darkness that comes with experiencing that. And Soryu was beaming so much love at me that I, I started smiling and laughing mm. and I couldn't stop myself from smiling mm. and feeling so profoundly loved and accepted. I was given the permission to not have to feel bad by being in his presence. And that, that experience was the most embodied experience of love that I had up until that moment in my life. Mm. So I had the help of Sori's presence mm. to feel it really in my heart and my body. It's great if there are people out there who can who can show that it's possible to be an extremely positive, effective and cognitive states, regardless of how awful the other person's feeling and accept their state as well and still radiate that love and not get hung up on that negativity. Mm -hmm. Just still being that anchor neurophysiological anchor for the other person to entrain to tune into learn from and how does that um can you say in brief how that works like it sounds like there's um just yeah how, how can you say in brief how you understand that to work So there are many ways in which it could work and people have studied how this could work, but the studies aren't very rigorous. There aren't many subjects and the studies are also a bit weird. Mm. So I can't say how good they are we need to do more research to understand what, what exactly is happening. Some general things that are happening uh, potentially is that magnetic fields generated by the heart influence each other. So th this, is, this is also questionable. Mm -hmm. We need to investigate the, the magnetic field more. Mm but people's hearts apparently generate one and it, it, it extends a certain distance beyond mm. our bodies. And I think that that has strong influence. We get a lot of information from that. I don't know how that works. I'm not a physicist, so mm. can't say much more. And this influence of the heart actually this direct influence of the heart has been measured in some experiments done by McCready, who's, who's a neuroscientist and cardiac scientist, uh, who's a bit questionable, I'd say. Hmm. But he's, he's done these interesting studies where he's had people close their eyes and sit next to each other uh, and, and radiate loving kindness and love at each other while with their eyes closed and their hearts would synchronize eventually over time. And this wouldn't happen when, or, you know, no, I can't say that. They, they, their hearts synchronized over time as they uh, tried to, as they focused on one another with their eyes closed. So there is some effect uh, that's purely physiological. There's some physiological entrainment uh, of biological rhythms 
this doesn't only this is not only confined to the heart this happens with breathing as well i think we pay attention to each other's breaths through various means just by just through visual information but i'm guessing also through hearing how the other person's breathing and somehow bodies tend to synchronize with each other this is a an automatic pro social function or mechanism we automatically begin to mimic each other and synchronize with each other and as a function of uh yeah largely oxytocin and this is just the way that bodies work by synchronizing with each other more oxytocin gets released and oxytocin promotes more prosocial behavior and greater identification or more accurate and intense identification uh, of emotional information. So oxytocin orients our attention towards emotional cues, both in prosody, so in, in our voices, and the expressions of our faces. So oxytocin orients us more to, to, to pay more attention to the eyes and the mouth. And eyes and mouth both communicate more effective information than the rest of our face. Um, oxytocin influences our, our heart activity. This is mediated by, by the vagus nerve. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's a fairly elaborate mechanism by which this is, what, by which the heart is regulated. Um, I won't go into too much detail just there. The gaze, once again, Eye gaze synchronizes brain regions across individuals over time. It seems just that our bodies are designed in ways that make, make it rewarding to mimic each other. Mm. But it's also important to note that we tend to only mimic positive emotional cues, or we tend to mimic positive emotional cues more than we do negative emotional cues. For example, when people are presented with uh, pictures of, of happy faces and angry faces, uh, people tend to mimic happy faces a lot more than angry ones. Mm. We, we pay less attention to angry faces. Hmm. Or we, we just don't copy them. It's not rewarding. It's not pro-social. That's good news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It does seem like there's some mimicking that happens of negative emotions, like especially if you're not careful or don't have good boundaries or good defenses or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I know I've got cotton negative spirals before that like seem to be gravitating towards somewhere else or you know uh vice versa that if i'm in a negative state that i can sort of could bring someone down with me uh as it were uh but it's sort of good news that it's sort of weighted towards going towards the positive thing hmm. yeah i've been just in general in my own life and practice like um I don't know how to put this, but you know, the summer that you were there and and a while after that, I got really interested in um, you know, what might be called we spaces or like collective shared states of consciousness type things, collective knowing, and you know, the kind of interpersonal meditation that you talked about. Circling is like very good at inducing that, from what I can tell. You know, in in certain um, it seems like certain configurations of circling are better than others for that uh kind of making that more likely. But there were there were several times that I sort of, with different people or in different configurations could get into, um, and they're tricky to describe, but like uh, things like um, knowing that other people in the group were like seeing something that I was also seeing or that there was like a shared 
knowing that was happening or shared thinking that was happening or like there was like a some kind of activity of thought or communication or experiencing that was sort of transcending one person but was like a shared activity and um, that interest has really resurged for me in recent months especially actually because of dyad conversations you know i have a lot of these conversations one-on-one -on -one with people both on the podcast on recording but also independently it's, it's probably my favorite way to communicate with people it's just one-on-one -on -one. Um, and uh, I know I've noticed that um, who I am and how I show up and what kinds of moves as it were are available to me both both physically but also emotionally or intellectually or other are um, sh very shaped by and co-determined by who I'm with and what ways they show up and that that they're I'm sort of able to think or manifest myself in different ways with different people. And, I, and I'm very attuned at this point to like who I can go to if I wanna experience the world a certain way or show up in a certain way or do a certain kind of thinking or a certain kind of spiritual practice um, or whatever it is that like, oh, this is a person that is, is like well-suited to exploring in this territory with. And um, yeah, in that, process of exploration that's just happening uh I've really found you know the way you're talking about self and other distinctions really resonates for me of like I, I don't think I've had quite the experience that you've had or though I wouldn't put it the way that you did but um I'm just noticing in myself that like you know and people talk about self and other all of the time all over spiritual practices or communities or whatnot but but just there's something happening in my own experience where I'm like you know I think it, the way I'd put it is almost something like the the deep ingrained metaphors or understanding of who I am and what it means to be a person or what it means to be around someone else are just like breaking it down and don't make as much sense where it, basically I think I, I thought of myself as an individual and I am this person in this space and I think this way and feel this way and see the world this way. And other people are also, you know, in their space and in their world and have their minds and their experiences. And um, that way of seeing things just doesn't make as much sense anymore. Like in this conversation, as in other diet conversations, it seems to make much more sense to me to see it as um, there are two people that are like co-creating a higher organism you know or or being that is shaped differently because of the two people that are composing that organism it's like tasha and an alien speaking are are a different person than if i was speaking to you know another one of my friends on on monday i'll probably have a recorded conversation with my dear friend jane and like who's been on the show before and like that's going to be a very different kind of interaction and space than this one and um really being attuned to the qualities of what is possible in connection with different people. And, um, you know, for example, I notice in conversation with you that like, I feel very um, intellectually alive, like I'm able to think clearly and digest things and um, connect concepts conceptually, but it's also still embodied. And I'm not like just in my head, uh, or at least I don't experience myself that way. Um, I'm able to like feel things and feel my body and be aware of you and body language and um, connect those things. And also, yeah, it feels easier to access my heart around you, speaking to you, like feeling things and speaking about these topics with you. I'm like, ah, oh, yes, I know how to feel meta in my heart. I, I don't feel meta in my heart all of the time. So I'm like very curious about that. Oh, you feel it all of the time. That sounds, or like can access your heart all the time. That sounds great. Um, but that feels more available around you. And um, probably other things that I'm less able to track or describe, but um, I'm curious what you think about all of that. Yeah. That is a lot. <laughs> there's, yes, well, people, there's so many people mm -hmm. on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they all have such different models of themselves and of the world. They have so many interests. But all that maps onto or is mapped within a brain. 
and within a nervous system and a body which are largely quite similar. And you might have various concepts and ideas that map onto, that are very different, but map onto the same brain structures somehow or onto similar dynamics, but this is all fairly vague and difficult to talk about mm. in precise terms. So concerning, concerning this idea of shared spaces and the possible states that can be attained uh, in interaction with various individuals and what can be accessed collectively when they're shared ideas. Just some rambly thoughts and ideas and interesting things to explore might be how, how does learning and sharing the same concepts but in different languages um, map on to the ability to access certain effective states change? Does language matter? That could be a fun thing to explore. Um, and, and coming up with concepts and values that people could all learn and adopt that would maximize positive emotional states. I think that's, that's something Maple, people at Maple have explored, at least I think I've peripherally seen that happening during some circling retreats. How could we maximize for particular emotional states? And what, what, if, what if we could polarize a group where half of the participants were primed to, to, to move into extremely negative emotional mm. states? and to adopt the worst beliefs mm. about humanity and juxtapose them with you know, the opposite, what mm. would emerge in such a circle? Mm. Mm. That sounds uh, risky, dangerous. <laughs> what if, what if there, there would be some, what if we just, the people would neutralize each other. Hmm. Maybe. Excuse me. Um, hmm. Taking a step back, I'm remembering that you um, sort of described your thesis and this investigation into compassion as uh, like a side quest. And it almost sounded maybe this isn't right, you can correct me if this is wrong, but like it almost sounded like uh, you answered the questions that you set out to answer about compassion. Um, and can you say more about what the larger quest is? And I don't know, maybe also what your plans are now, you know, now that you've finished the thesis and how you hope to keep continue, continuing embarking on this quest. Mm. Yes, this side quest has been completed. Well I done. understand I understand compassion to an adequate degree. There's uh -huh. always more to explore and I'll probably continue exploring. Mm -hmm. But my primary focus has returned to wanting to develop technologies that could effectively modulate brain activity in such a way that we alleviate suffering but also, and pain, but my, my secret specific interest is to induce altered states of consciousness and to enhance human cognition and to enhance subjective experience, make it very exciting to live every single day and to explore the vast state of, uh, the, the vast space of conscious states because there's so much that we can do. There's so much that can be explored. And I think a lot of people are hung up on 
on how important it is to be sober and a normal waking consciousness, I think that's that's just limiting. Mm. We have brains. <laughs> we might as well explore them. And we might as well find ways that make it better to be alive. So I want to work on technologies or work in teams that explore ways of inducing altered states, not with chemical means, but through technology. I, I love chemistry. I love psychoactive chemicals. And they're, they're a source of inspiration for me. But I think it would be better if we could target the brain in much more specific, precise ways. I think technology would also allow us to modulate the brain in, in more creative ways that we don't get with just chemical means. You can combine different chemicals to produce specific experiences, but if you could break down and fully understand how, how the brain works and, and you could influence it, its activity in extremely precise ways, maybe through uh, through neural, through nanorobotics, for example, then you could just create, be, be, be an artist of, of consciousness. Mm. I love that. Mm. I don't know how long it will take to get there. I don't know what all the steps are to get there. But I know that the first step is to just understand what on earth is going on in the nervous system. Mm. And to start with very simple nervous systems. This year, I've, I've read more on the topic of consciousness. And I've come to, I, I've also been in touch with people who are, who are prominent researchers in the field and have come to understand the field of neuroscience and where it's at better. And I understand that we're still quite far away from really knowing how, how it all works. And so just right now, I'd like to focus on doing fundamental neuroscience research on, on very basic things, like how, it, what is an emotional state? What is a brain state? Uh, what, what is, can we identify different states in, in nematodes, for example? These are creatures that have only 302 neurons, and yet there's still so much to learn about nervous systems from nematodes. Mm -hmm. So just working on that for several years, right now, the field of human brain science is very crude. We have a lot of fMRI studies, a lot of EEG studies that show us certain correlates between various cognitive tasks or activities or um, experiences of psychedelics. We see correlates between those things and activations in different brain regions. But that doesn't say very much. That doesn't give us control over what's going on. We can learn things about the brain, but it's still too crude to do anything interesting. And then there's, of course, the whole recent issue with replication crisis and what if fMRI studies are all wrong? I'm not, I don't know too much about that, so I can't say more than that. The field is vast. It's very difficult to study the brain, but someone needs to do the work. And I guess I'm alive and I have to do something mm. and I wanna do something useful. And what I, the thing that's useful is to do very basic, fundamental neuroscience. Mm. So that's what I want to focus on in the short term, which uh -huh. is the span of a decade. Uh -huh. And in the very, very long term, it's coming up with tech to, to influence brain activity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make us essentially trip all the time, uh -huh. but in ways that are suitable to our own desires and needs.
Yeah, it's a really vast, vast vision, and I'm I'm glad that to have the chance to hear you articulate it. Um, we've covered a lot of territory. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about um, yourself or your your learnings over the years, or anything else that you'd like to talk about? I'd like to talk about eye gazing. Mm. Yes, please. I recommend it so much. Mm. I did the, the first time I tried eye gazing was when I was 19 with someone I'd met at, a holotro at the holotropic breath workshop. And they proposed that I should eye gaze with them. I was very introverted and afraid of social interaction then, which has vastly subsided and changed over time. But the first time I looked at a person for 15 minutes, I felt like I was, I was going down the deep and I started seeing three eyes, their face started shifting. And that, that started my obsession with eye gazing, which slowly crept up on me. I remember eye gazing with you for 56 minutes, mm. I believe it was. Wow. It was quite, quite interesting. A lot of things change in the visual field for me when I stare at people. I remember seeing your body turn into this rainbow, in, into these layered rainbows that mm. extended vastly mm. beyond you, and you became this very focused, tiny figure in front of me. Mm. We were sitting in a circle. We, we were quite a distance away from each other. I've I gazed. I like doing eye gaze, eye gazing for 30 minutes to over an hour because that's when that's when my that's when I keep getting more information bottom up that that breaks my preconceived or preformed model of what the person is and who they are and this this constant influx of novel sensory information uh, it somehow puts puts my experience into disarray and I there there starts to the, the experience becomes psychedelic people's faces morph into various things I've I've seen people turn into all kinds of anime characters and this is all uh, without the use of chemical substances, people turn into Buddhas, people have turned into very scary things as well. Mm. I've had one person turn into a clown and an insect before me. Mm. This is all with prolonged staring. And it becomes easier over time. At first, it's, it's very emotionally triggering and can be challenging. But eventually, as you have more and more experience with feeling and allowing whatever's coming up to come up, then you can just go into ever deeper states. And I don't know what the purpose is. I don't know what can be found, but I'd urge people to experiment more with eye gazing because it's, it's such an interesting practice and makes it easier to accept people and to interact with people. It makes it less scary. It also gives you, it's very good for training your models mm. of people and what is possible emotionally. What else can be said about eye gazing? I think because I'm somewhat aborting the mission of writing more extensively about these topics, I, I just do eye gazing for fun. Hmm. But I urge people to maybe pick up, pick up the line from me. Uh -huh. Yes. Do you make any, what, what do you make of different people visually? Turning into very different things. Like, do you make any 
intellectual sense of that or does it seem random to you or something else? I think people turn or I start seeing people or I, I pattern match some concept which then gets rendered in this visual, in the visual medium. Mm. There's some people whose whose characteristics and yeah, whose characteristics just seem to line up with some ideas that I had about a particular anime character, mm. and then their faces just turn into that. And this also happens when I look at myself in the mirror for very long periods of time. If I think certain things about myself, then my face changes to match those ideas. Wow. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I, I thought it might be something like that, but I'm, I'm happy to hear how you describe it and, and also that you think it is that way rather than, I mean, because you, yeah, I mean, just as easily could have said, oh, I think it's random and meaningless. It's just noise or something, but it sounded meaningful to me. And then I'm, it was interesting to hear how you make sense of that. Uh, and it definitely makes me want to try it. So uh, I don't, I don't know that I, I did, I didn't have any visuals that probably the time that you and I did eye gazing is the longest that I've done eye gazing. And I don't remember having any visuals that time or at any other time. I, um, I remember mostly, uh, I mean, this is just my experience of it, but mostly that uh, I wasn't enjoying that particular circle. And then I was like looking around, I was like, yeah, it's not a great circle. And then our eyes, but I was like, okay, well, this is like, I like it. And then, uh, you know, this is much more interesting than what's happening in this. And the circle continued around us. And, uh, you know, we, we just went into our own little world there. And uh, yeah, it makes me excited to try try more of that. So, yeah. Mm. Also, a bit of darkness is helpful. Mm. Mm. That gives more space for top down processing to add some filter of experience that might not be there, the purely sensory domain. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. Huh. Huh. Anything else you'd like to say or converse about on anything at all? Maybe in pathogens. Mm. I don't have very extensive experience with in pathogens, only a little bit. I've done MDMA a couple of times. I thought it was helpful. I've done various phenethylamines. They're my favorite. I love 2CB. Mm. Very, very pathogenic, and also very visual. I think it's fun to explore interpersonal practices with 2CB because you can additionally explore the effect of a very intense and obvious visual changes that can take place immediately. I'm, I, I think I'm curious about how you've incorporated or thought about and pathogens within the context of your desire to present or communicate, teach people meta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, maybe just first a quick question. I, I, I was surprised to hear you say that you found MDMA helpful because it sounds like you had a pretty bad experience at least once and or like an intensely negative experience in any case and I wonder uh, if you could say more about them being MDMA in particular being helpful if, if if you did have that intensely negative experience. So that first time it started out intensely negative but it turned into an intensely positive experience afterwards because I took myself out of mm. that awful spiral mm. by forcing myself to be social and forcing myself to feel good. Mm. 
And I think just the crux of that experience was saying, no, you can feel good and you have to work for it. You have to do the most painful thing you can imagine, which was to go out and dance. Uh -huh. That was extremely painful for me when there was this black hole of you should die mm. pulling me in. So it was helpful in that sense that I could learn to choose to have fun and to yeah, honor that I don't have to feel bad, mm -hmm. but I have to work for it. I have to work to feel good as well. Mm -hmm. But then the other MDMA sessions, I think they just allowed me to process emotions that I didn't allow myself to experience while I was at university. Mm -hmm. So much, I had to keep a lot of it on in the back burner while I was focusing on studies, just yeah. couldn't process those feelings. Then MDMA makes it so deep and beautiful to just feel everything. Mm. When I process emotions, in just meditation or somatic practice, it it feels a bit like I'm just doing the grunt work of moving negative emotions out of my system. But with MDMA, it feels really beautiful and poetic. I think it also has to do with me not attaching stories as much these days. I just get, get the gunk out mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I don't make a big deal out of it. Yes. It's not poetic or artistic or aesthetically valuable. Mm. But on MDMA, I find it aesthetically valuable mm. and extra beautiful. Mm. Mm. I appreciate hearing a little bit more about that because, uh, yeah, just as I say, what you say surprised me at first. Uh, so, um, and I think, you know, that that's sort of maybe a way into answering the question that you asked me, which is um, I know what my own experiences with MDMA have been and that they've been helpful for me. And um, I know that it's been helpful for other people. I know that it's been not so pleasant for other people, you know, it really varies. And so I'm pretty clear about my own experience and how I want to relate to MDMA and, and pathogens in general. Uh, and I can speak more to that and I'm, I'm cautious to, uh, you know, like unequivocally endorse them or something like that, because uh, I am aware that they can be very intense and very negative and uh, maybe even in some cases harmful. And so it's like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can like endorse or recommend them for someone other than myself. Um, they do seem pretty clearly net positive for me, even though I've had um, intensely negative experiences on them as well. It's like still net positive for me. Um, I think, um, what are the pathogens that I've tried? So I've done MDMA multiple times and then uh, cacao has been very helpful as well. And uh, also phenibut. And both of those are uh, legal substances. MDMA of course is not. Uh, so I can't recommend it for that reason as well. <laughs> uh, don't break the law um, or whatever. Uh, you are responsible for your own ethical choices and uh, I am responsible for the consequences of my own actions as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know if Fenibit is typically characterized as an empathogen, but it certainly seems to have that quality for me of a very like heart opening uh, quality. Um, I think. Abergic and anxiolytic. Hmm. Can you say more about what that is and how that relates to pathogens? I think that many times we aren't able to access positive or loving emotional states because we are just socially anxious mm. and afraid and tensed. And like GABAergic substances, they, um, they agonize GABAergic where GABA receptors, the GABAergic system gets activated and this relaxes us 
overall, mm -hmm. similar to the way alcohol works. And anxiolytic, it just uh, prevents us from entering anxious, tense states. I see. I see. So technically not an empathogen, but uh, yes, yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, it, seem, it seems um, supportive of the kind of territory that I want to be exploring. And, um, you know, uh, one thing I really had to wrestle with with this issue is um, the fifth precept, because I've taken the, fifth, the, the precepts and the fifth precept in particular in a Buddhist context, you know, different people interpret it this differently, but the conservative way to be interpreted would be like no substances, no, you know, drugs, no alcohol. Um, and actually, that was the way I saw it for many years. Uh, I, I explored drugs and alcohol quite heavily in my teenage years. And then when I got into meditation, I sort of set that aside and uh, was less interested in them. And certainly in the monastic training, I was not uh, exploring those things and found it useful for a time to have a, um, you know, sort of conservative view of these things and say, you know, like, this is not helpful to me. This is not what I need. And then I think since leaving the monastery a little over a year ago, like I've sort of come to a different perspective, which is um, mainly focused on the qualities of like heedlessness and intoxication. And, you know, mindfulness is about cultivating heedfulness, like being aware of your body and your surroundings and what state of mind you're in. And that, you know, I've spent a lot of time cultivating that and I don't want to cultivate heedlessness and not be aware of those things. And, you know, things like cannabis and alcohol for me certainly um, cultivate heedlessness as, as opposed to heedfulness and mindfulness. And so I'm, I, I don't want to take cannabis or alcohol or other substances that seem to go in the opposite direction of mindfulness. Uh, and similarly, I don't want to take things that are uh, addictive, that are, um, you know, patterning in such a way that I, I need them or I'm dependent on them. And so um, if I'm avoiding those two qualities, then other things seem fair game. And as far as I can tell, psychedelics and pathogens uh, these other substances, there is like a number of substances that, you know, aren't cultivating heedlessness and do seem to be positive without causing dependency. And so I'm like, yeah, it seems fair game to explore those as long as I'm not cultivating heedlessness, as long as I'm not becoming dependent on these substances. So um, I was interested in, in trying MDMA from that perspective, uh, cacao and fenibit, as I say, both also seem, you know, very, very mild and, and not... Um, cultivating either of those negative qualities. Um, and then, you know, I've explored more traditional psychedelics as well. And um, I think uh, MDMA, I mean, in, I, I first took it in high school. And I, I mean, the way that I conceived it then was just like, oh, this is something that's going to make things quite pleasant and blissful and like happy. And I just took a little bit. But at the time, it was like, it almost felt like there was, um, I took like half of a dose of MDMA or whatever. And it felt like there was like a button in my brain that was being pushed that was like, you will be happy. <laughs> and it felt very mechanical, like uh, just almost like steely for so that's the adjective that comes to mind is like, like metal, um, like uh, mechanical. And uh, it was like, this button is being pressed and you will be happy and you are happy and now you're happy. And like, I was happy, but it was very, <laughs> very like, you know, force sort of. And um and, and, you know, because I just took half a dose, it was like not extremely intense. It was just like, yeah, there's happiness. And um, that was the way I thought about that substance for a long time. And then there started to be an emphasis on using it for like trauma healing and emotional processing. And I, be I became very interested in that, especially because, you know, I've suffered a lot and that's been a major motivator for my own practice is like resolving my suffering. And, you know, um, it seemed like that would be a way to resolve some deep emotional issues. And so I, that's why I took it. And it was interesting because when, when I've taken it over the last year, um, I think four times in the last year, my experience was neither of those things. It wasn't just like, oh, it's blissful or, oh, it's processing emotions. I mean, the, the this is metaphorical, but it was almost like if the MDMA was speaking to me, it was like, oh, that's sweet, honey, that you want to like produce, you know, process your emotions and heal your trauma. Like you've done a lot of that. You're good. Like not, not like I'm completely healed or something, but like, that's not what we're here for today. You know, we've got other business <laughs> to attend to. Um, 
And, and, and really the, the role that it's had for me, I, I did not expect at all, but it, it's neither of those things. It's not just blissfulness or um, emotional processing. It's, um, uh, and I've described this in a few places in, in my book but, uh, and elsewhere, but um, almost like, unblocking my intuitive faculties such that um, in particular like verbal messages can arise in my mind and then I can speak them or write them down and um, a lot of the writing that I've done over the last year has been sort of either directly from these trips that I've had with MDMA or because of the intuitive faculty that's been unlocked through using that and uh, it's like uh, now, like basically thoughts arise and then I'm like, yeah, I should write this down. And then I decide what to do with the thing that I write down. You know, sometimes it's posting it publicly and sometimes it's just a journal entry or somewhere in between or something like that. But um, yeah, it's really been about unlocking intuition and specifically like verbal intuition and articulation. Almost the way that I've described is like, like, like I'm a messenger, um, less in the sense of like, oh, I'm some anointed divine prophet or something and more like uh, that the metaphor is like like a mailman like you've got mail like here's some mail please accept this message you know like I have a message for you please read it and sign here and I'll be off on my way and just a normal guy with a message you know like here we go uh, and um, yeah I didn't expect that at all and and so um, I don't know almost I mean I, I, I can see how MDMA is useful for meta and that's something I'm interested in exploring more in particular doing meta before an MDMA trip for several days before and seeing if that opens the heart more and, and accesses those qualities but you know um in some ways cacao and fenibit have been maybe easier for for cultivating that quality of just heart sheer heart opening and um and I can already feel things in my heart and feel meta it's it's not uh, stable like oh, I feel it all of the time but it's a capacity that's available to me and so MDMA almost feels like this other thing of of this intuitive faculty uh this verbal knowledge that comes out yeah I want to highlight for people listening that it's really not necessary to use MDMA or any empathogens or even fenibut or cacao to access these states of loving kindness and warmth, compassion. It's actually quite easy to cultivate it. The more you feel it, the more you realize how easy it is to keep feeling it. Mm -hmm. Well said. I'm glad you said that, and and that's why there's, you know, the why I put out these guided meditations, and I have my meta book, and you know, various YouTube videos and stuff. It's like it, it, uh, it, it one, yeah, definitely you can cultivate it without these substances. Those are not necessary at all, and um, I don't. I would take issue a little bit with it being easy. I like I can see why you would say that, and it, it it's easy for me at this point. My sense of it is like if people have trauma or emotional blockages or like their heart is closed then it's not easy and it's very hard and and um in those cases i think meta is not the thing to go to that you sort of need to learn how to unblock those things first and you know there's lots of things but like therapy or or journaling or um yeah i mean in those cases like mdma might be helpful because it can be for trauma healing but you know other things um you know especially the self therapy methods i think ifs in particular and you know, things like biomotive, which you and I have both done, and, um, you know, like coherence therapy or something like that, like these sort of, um, in the coherence therapy frame, they, they, they talk about as like transformative therapies, where it's like, oh, you're actually resolving these root issues. Um, I think that that really needs to happen so that people's hearts can be open so that it's safe to feel emotions, so that they can express themselves fluidly. I think if you, uh, if your heart is not open, if there are these blockages, if there is trauma, meta is not easy. And then when you unblock that, it is very easy. Um, so and I almost wonder in retrospect, I mean, you know, I didn't have the experience, but when you were talking about your MDMA experience, I wonder if like, oh, your heart was closed at that time. And that's why it was so painful because- uh, It was quite closed. It was extremely cold. Yes. And that, that's a very painful experience to, to have it. I mean, because it, it's like, it's almost like there's like pressure and you just like, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that manifests in such a variety of ways for different people. I've been a, astonished to learn about the variety of ways that 
cultivating metta can be very uncomfortable for people or painful or challenging. Um, mm -hmm. But but for many people, it is not easy. And then when it is easy, it's easy. Yeah, it, it mm -hmm. definitely is easy when it's easy. But if it's not easy, it's really not easy. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 the, the point stands that, yeah, you absolutely do not need uh, substances to explore this territory or to open the heart. Um, I think probably, um, you know, if, if, it, if, it, if, if your heart is not too burdened by trauma and things like this, then, you know, just guided meta meditations are a really good thing. And then if, if there are those blockages, then doing this sort of self-therapy or working with a therapist is, 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 I think, the most helpful thing. One thing I learned from some of the people that I talked to during my ethnographic interviews, some of these individuals were uh, were licensed compassion uh, facilitators, compassion or compassion meditation facilitators, and they told me about their process of learning to feel this love, and they discussed how challenging it was at first. And some of the main points or conclusions from those conversations were that what you're feeling right now is exactly what you should be feeling and you shouldn't be feeling anything else. So if you're trying to cultivate metta and you think that you should be feeling this lovely flowery warmth in your heart, then then it's gonna be awful because you aren't feeling that. But the point is what you're feeling is exactly right. And it's not about what you're feeling, but it's it, it can at first just be about the approach towards what you're feeling, accepting and having this frame of, I love whatever it is that I'm feeling. I don't have to feel love or my idea of what that is, just feel what I, what I'm feeling and allowing that to be and allowing that to evolve in whatever it can evolve into. Just allowing that to happen. And then another important point was just realizing that you are allowed to feel love and you're allowed to stop suffering when you're ready. Mm -hmm when 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 you can you can and you don't have to be there but you can stop and you can accept that love yeah those are really helpful suggestions i appreciate you passing them on from the wise bodhisattvas you spoke to in your ethnographic study <laughs> It was wonderful. The interview questions you asked were amazing. Like, uh, just very, I think you asked, I don't know, like 12 or 15 different questions and they were like, ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes. So were those conversations recorded? Yes. Uh, I would love to hear a recording, at least of, of my uh, conversation because I, I, I still think there are things that I said to you in that conversation that I have not said since to anyone else so uh, it would be interesting wow. to to hear I, I'm not even sure I've thought about them since then so um, it was it, it, a very profound profound conversation for me at least to um, to share and I'm reminded of a sudden of um, on the Guru Viking podcast there's a really great series of interviews with this gentleman named Lauren Roche and he talks about uh how he became kind of a teacher and helping other people. And one of the things that he did was just, just basically ethnographic studies with meditators of like really listening to people and having these long conversations with people about their history with meditation and spiritual practice. And just like really taking the time to understand how they see things and get their world and learn about what their experiences have been like. And he's, he said something like meditators deserve that, like that respect to, to really listen to them and understand where they're coming from. And that was kind of what I felt in that, in that conversation was like, yeah, being surprised by things that I said. And um, uh, the, the, there's a um, beauty and depth to the, my own experience of loving kindness that I hadn't, hadn't been able to even notice for myself just until you gave me the opportunity as, as really as a gift to, to see that. And that was, that was beautiful. And, and I think, I think um, at the time I was sort of 
um, I, you know, I'd, I'd left Maple relatively recently and I was starting to teach loving kindness a little bit online doing my weekly sessions. And yeah, it was just increasingly making it part of what I was doing. And it really gave me a lot of renewed motivation to be like, yeah, this is, this is why this matters is this, these feelings of love, uh, are possible to feel and you can radiate them through the whole universe and it really affects people and like yeah we should we should spread this love and uh it, it was really um motivating for me yeah but rem remembering your music video yes point at the birds yes yes <laughs> loving kindness yes that's that's uh the best way i've found so far to communicate this sort of thing so yes i want to say that Unfortunately, your video didn't render and just turned out black, oh. which is so unfortunate. Oh. When I was writing my when I was writing the ethnography, I was rewatching the videos, but I couldn't rewatch your video because it just didn't record well. Ah. So was the I audio also notes. not working? I will need to check. The audio might still exist. Mm. Gotcha. But I wanted yeah. to still mention, there was a moment when you talked about your experience with beings or devas, I mm. guess. And that's a topic that I've been thinking about more these days. Also, uh, during the during our interview, during your interview, then I wish I could have engaged more with you and spoken to you, but I just had to interview you, and I was in this space where I was only absorbing information intellectually. I felt like a robot, mm. but I was there asking the questions, and and I, I'm so grateful for the depth with which you went into your experiences. It was extremely valuable. Hmm. But on the topic of on the topic of devas and these entities, I don't know what to say. I don't know what their ontological status is. I don't know if they're just conglomerates of certain effective and until higher order ideas which present themselves as agents within our experience that seem to be external to ourselves. They might just be, they're, they're probably just archetypal experiences, but I, 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 I can't say too much about beings. Maybe they, they are separate. I don't want to say too much. Mm -hmm. But I've had experience with beings as well mm. in meditation where, for example, I've cultivated a certain relationship with Ganesh. And whenever I practice the Ganesh mantra, I sometimes see him. Mm. He comes to me when I close my eyes and then I'm in this visual space. This is, this is just a normal sitting meditation, chanting the Ganesh mantra. I'm seeing him and being in his presence and feeling the joy and his power and his vibrant, colorful presence. Mm. I've only had that with Ganesh. I haven't had it with any other beings. But I find it interesting how that is a real experience, just as the holotropic breath experiences were. But those goddesses that I met weren't very culture they weren't present within culture they were just specific personal personally generated goddesses but Ganesh is a very prominent figure across culture and I wonder where he comes from mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I wonder how our neurology makes it possible to experience that mm -hmm. by singing the Ganesh mantra for example yes we have associations to Ganesh when we sing about Ganesh and yes I've seen images of him and statuettes but it's great how the brain can just bring him into this full animated state mm. and come to me with come to me from the outside through people who have his tattoos 
I always noticed that. Hmm. Of course, the reticular, the reticular activating system will orient me towards noticing Ganesh because I care about him because of the experiences that I've had in meditation. But it's sometimes a bit odd to receive a gift of a Ganesh statuette from someone unexpectedly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow, yeah. So beings are of interest. Yes, yes. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful story from um, Junpo Dennis Kelly Roshi where uh, I, I I think I have a tweet about this from his biography. I'll have to I'll have to find it if I can. But um, essentially, he was sort of insulting Ganesh, and while he was with his guru, and then his guru is like, "Oh, Ganesh is not going to like that," and then. Uh, uh, hijinks ensue. I don't want to spoil the story on the podcast, but I'll just link to the tweet if I can find it in the uh, the, the Twitter thread that I post for this uh, conversation. But hijinks ensue. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd like to know what happened. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll share the passage with you. It, it deserves to be told in its full splendor, so uh, which I would not be able to do. So, And it's, it's also not my story. So uh, Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think I've mostly, I mean, devas are so interesting, but I, I think I've, I don't know that I quite have the same experience that you do, but really feel a close connection to Guan Yin. Um, she doesn't come to me, like I can't see her, but um, have have a sort of a relationship with it, with her, I would say. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, a lot of the way that I see this is, is sort of framed in, um, in, it's just been useful to use the way that Rob Berbea talks about this of ways of seeing it's because, because if I get into like a, a, an intellectual space about it, I'm like, well, what is happening? I mean, yeah, the brain and the universe and like these beings, I don't know, it's just very confusing. I don't feel uh, equipped to like come to the kind of answer that I would like to hear about what exactly is happening. So instead, I just like put on these different ways of seeing where it's like, well, I don't know if this is um, like true or complete in a certain sense, but it seems useful. And so um, another related way of seeing, it's not Davis exactly, but is um, like, mm, I, yeah, I guess the way that I tend to see it is almost like people have, people have, um, I don't know, some kind of, uh, some kind of non-material mind that can be accessed at any time from anyone. And so like, I could try to speak to you across space time, even if we're not talking and like communicate with you. And so that also applies to non-material entities, like say, for example, the dead or yeah, devas. And, um, you know, I've, I've uh, had a practice for some time of, of um, you know, speaking to my grandparents that have passed away or uh, other people that have passed away or um, other people in my life that I'm not able to literally speak to at a given moment, either for practical or interpersonal reasons, but like try to have some kind of communication with them. And, you know, maybe that's just a, a, a psychological imaginal exercise that has no bearing in reality. That's totally fine. It still seems useful and interesting for me. And maybe it is, you know, based in some kind of reality where we do have non-material causal effects on each other, which it certainly seems to me to have based on various experiences I've had, but I don't need it to have those. Uh, and, and that sort of seems like, yeah, devas are just, if devas exist, they're, they're simply um, non-material physical non-material positive entities that exist that uh, we can connect or with. Or somehow rendered, rendered. In, in material. Yes, yes. Or how our bodies are able to render the experience of them. Yeah. I mean, with Guan Yin in particular, the way that I experience her is like that she, um, I mean, because her whole thing is that she can manifest in whatever form is needed for you. So I, I have a way of seeing everyone as Guan Yin or um, looking for her presence in other people like this, that Guan Yin is moving through this person or something like that. And and then that way I can feel very loved in particular, like, oh, this person is trying to love me. And that's like a, a, a gift of love from Guan Yin. And that's, you know, don't know if that's true, but it's been a very like sweet and tender connection to have with her. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to say about devas or anything?
I think for now that I'll just continue exploring them. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm so glad that uh, uh, we had this conversation and um, thank you so much for your time, Aileen. Thank you, Tashin, for creating this space. It was so fun to talk about all the topics and I hope that people find find some, some of these ideas useful, helpful, and maybe I could also share a link to my thesis if anybody is interested in reading more about these topics in a more condensed form as yes, opposed please. to going through a bunch of literature. <laughs> yes, that would be wonderful. I'd love that. We'll definitely link to that for sure. Yes. Mm. Okay, well, thank you so much.